we're glad to have you here. This is this is another big step for South Carolina. It's I, I don't know if we have the assets all working together like this uh, in other states. If if they are doing it, we'd like to know if they're doing something that we haven't thought of. But this is um, this is a great step forward. We're doing all we can to educate our young people. We are growing, we have businesses expanding, we have people all over the world that want to invest hundreds of millions and billions of dollars. Here we have parents raising children that want them to be safe and get educated. They know that education is the key to their future. There are so many things that we have to do that involve or require public safety. I think we have the best law enforcement establishment in the whole country, but this is taking, taking us again into the, the future, the great future for our people. This is the Center for School Safety and Targeted Violence. As you know, we're in an, an old school building, and as you know, that's where some of the most dangerous and violent instances and incidents occur with shooters. So how do you guard against that? Besides having good, strong laws and good, strong law enforcement, you have to have good training. If you've done it before, you can do it again. And if you train under conditions that simulate those that you would be responding to in dangerous, highly dangerous and sensitive emergencies, then the chances of successful performance increase dramatically. So that's what we're doing. That's what this school is going to be used for, for law officers, for school administrators, for teachers, for bus drivers, for everyone in between, to be able to simulate and respond to an active shooter situation in a school. And of course, that will also trans, um, transfer to, to other such buildings and locations. So that's what we're doing today. This is a great step forward for our people, and we look forward to keep doing things that move our people forward. Okay. Good morning. Uh, as the governor said, this is, a, this is a great opportunity for South Carolina. It's a great opportunity for our law enforcement, and more importantly, it's a great opportunity to try and do everything we can within our powers to keep our kids safe. I think we all realize that our children are the most valuable resource that we have. And uh, when we, as parents, send them to school, we expect to pick them up in the afternoon. And so that's what this is all about. Governor, I wanna first thank you and I wanna thank members of the General Assembly and especially the Lexington uh, delegation for all the support uh, that they had for the concept of what we're about to do here at Gilbert a special thank you go to the rest of the residents of Gilbert. And uh, I'm probably going to end up skipping over somebody, but I just want to say um, everyone that I talked to when we started talking about this concept was supportive. I talked to uh, Mayor Reeder here, and he's, he's here somewhere. I don't know where he's at. There he is. And, uh, and I know that the Gilbert community is excited about this, and uh, we are as well. I want to thank Lexington uh, District 1 School Board. Obviously, it would not be possible without them, the members of that board, um, the chair of that board. Uh, we, would not, we would not be having this event here today. I want to thank Dr. Postawait. I think she had another engagement. I don't know whether she made it uh, here, but um, I want to thank her for her unwavering support uh, as well for keeping our young people safe. None of this would have been possible again, were not for the unbelievable support that we had from this community and from the school district and from the General Assembly, members of the General Assembly. From the beginning, uh, getting support of this community, to me, was the most important thing. And I told Mayor Reader this morning, the one thing that I want to assure this community is that SLED is going to be a good community citizen as well. And we're going to be a good partner here in this community. This partnership between Lex Lexington District 1, the Department of Education, and SLED began with a conversation that I had with former uh, Department of Education Superintendent Molly Spearman uh, in January of 2022. 
And those uh, communications continued to grow. And then we had a conversation. I had a conversation with uh, former superintendent of Lexington District 1, Greg Little, who's here, and uh, Lexington County Sheriff Jay Coon. And, and then I started talking with, again, all the members of uh, the Lexington delegation and members of the General Assembly, the governor's office. Uh, and again, it was something that um, it was probably one of the easiest things I've ever had to do to try to sell um, in state government was to, is what a benefit this would be to our children. So after nearly two years, this concept is now reality, and I could not be more proud again of the teamwork that got us here. I've never heard any dissent, I've heard nothing but buy-in from everyone. SLED's active shooter unit began consistently training in this facility in 2017, but our unit started training initially uh, back in 2012, and we started doing that um, with Homeland Security funds, and that was, program was funded through Homeland Security. As of today, we've trained over 250,000 people nationwide in violence response and recovery with focus being here in South Carolina. And I think that everyone knows that recent events across the country show us that we must do all we can to prepare our law enforcement, our school personnel, our students, parents, and the community for these unimaginable events. The Center for School Safety and Targeted Violence will train personnel year round in actual uh, school environment. And that was the big advantage to, to having a facility like this. Um, we try to train in the environment. We can't recreate this at the police academy or anywhere else. We can't recreate long hallways, cafeterias, gyms, uh, stairwells that we, that we have here in a school like this. And that's what made this environment uh, just the perfect uh, place to conduct this training. It's important, again, to have that facility. Uh, like I've said, the school had everything that we were looking for uh, to, to develop it into a state-of-the-art training facility. Some examples of the type of training that we'll be doing is we obviously will be doing active shooter and reality-based training. We'll be doing behavioral threat assessments. We'll have two full-time behavioral science unit agents that will work here with our local schools in an effort to identify issues and those troubled students before is a crisis. We'll provide mental health uh, first aid for children and adults and rescue task force training with our first other first responder agencies like our fire and EMS. We'll do tactical bus assault training, stop the bleed training. We'll also uh, include our community members in that training as well if they would like. Again, I am very grateful to Lexington School District 1 the Lexington and Gilbert communities and our state leaders for entrusting SLED with operating the Center for School Safety and Targeted Violence. I can't think of a more important mission than keeping our kids safe. And Governor, again, I want to thank you for your uh, support as always in this most important endeavor and for you always supporting us in law enforcement here in South Carolina, and I want to thank you for that. Good morning, Ellen Weaver, State Superintendent of Education, and I just want to add my thanks um, to Chief Keels, to each of the different stakeholders that have made today's event um, possible. This is truly one of the most important conversations, maybe the most important conversation that we could be having regarding education in the state of South Carolina, because if our students and our teachers aren't safe, nothing else matters. And so if we want our students to achieve their highest expectation, their full potential, we know that they have to be able to concentrate on the learning and the instruction that's happening in the classroom in front of them. And on behalf of the entire education system in South Carolina, I just want to say a heartfelt thank you to every single member of our law enforcement community. When we look at events that we have seen happen around the state in previous months, um, some of these swatting incidents that we've heard about, the response time of our law enforcement has been absolutely unbelievable. Minutes when minutes matter. And so we are so grateful for this partnership, for the ability to, as the governor often says, communicate, collaborate, and cooperate around this issue of school 
school safety. A few things that we have been working on at the Department of Education in regards to school safety, um, again, to increase our communication and our collaboration, is we have created an Office of Safe Schools that is now headed um, by James Bubba Rawl, former member of SLED, so thank you, Chief. Y'all trained him up well. Um, we are so thankful to have him as a member of our team. Um, also, he formerly served on a school board, um, and so as our school board members here can attest, that is a, a, an important skill set in and of itself to be able to speak both the law enforcement and the education lingo. And so we're incredibly grateful to have him as a force multiplier on our team at the department. Um, the governor will speak um, in a minute about my number one budget priority this year, which is school mapping. Um, we know that the ability of law enforcement to understand the situation and the dynamic into which they are moving is absolutely essential when minutes matter and lives are on the line. And so I'm incredibly grateful to the governor for his partnership that he'll talk about later to the Education Oversight Committee and to so many others who understand that we have to focus on the fundamentals if we are going to prioritize safety and obviously having a shared mapping system that both our educators and our law enforcement can access, um, <clears throat> especially in a mobile age like we live in, even on your cell phone, is really, really important um, to ensure that our students are safe. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention briefly um, in our budget request to the General Assembly this next year is um, essentially a digital fencing tool that will allow us to continue to assess um, alarming or um, worrisome behavior um, that is taking place on school issued devices. Um, at the Department of Education, we've already piloted this program with over 50,000 students in the state um, being part of it um, and have seen uh, critical incidents that were stopped um, because we were monitoring this behavior on school devices in real time. Um, and so as we take um, this matter of safety seriously, we have to take an all of the above approach. So what's going to happen at this center, the incredible training that our SROs and so many others are going to receive here, what we are doing to protect the digital spaces and environments that our students are exposed to within our school system. And then of course, we have to think about what's actually happening on those digital devices. And so I have started a conversation um, with our local superintendents to understand how they are addressing the issue of cell phone use within schools. We know that cyberbullying, threats, and many other things are happening on those um, personal digital devices, and so that is something that we have to continue to think about and address as we, as we look at this critical issue of school safety. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Director Woods, and again, I just want to say one more time how deeply grateful we are for this partnership with our law enforcement community. Thank you, and good morning. I'm Rob Woods. I'm director of the South Carolina Department of Public Safety. DPS, we're responsible for administering state grant funds that support the school resource officer program. These state dollars serve to fill the gap for local law enforcement agencies that may not have the resources to put a SRO in a school. Uh, of course, we're very proud to fill this role. Uh, we've had this since 2021, uh, and, and we really, enjoy and are proud of being able to work with the governor and the General Assembly to reach that goal of putting one SRO in every school. We, we recognize that the first line of defense for schools very often is having a law enforcement officer physically present on that campus. So this is, a, is clearly a, a very worthwhile goal and, and one of which we're going to continue to strive to accomplish to see one in every school. I think it's also important to point out though that with SROs they, they serve more than just as a defense to the schools. They very often are, are counselors, they're mentors, in some cases they're teachers, uh, and, and very often they serve as a bridge between the law enforcement community and children who often come from underserved communities. So in many ways, SROs are truly what we in, in, see as embodying community policing. Um, just to give you an update on where we are in achieving that goal of bringing an SRO into every school. There are currently 1,284 schools that are eligible for SROs in South Carolina. 1,109, 1,109 of those schools currently have funded SROs, have funded positions. And that means 600, or I should say 678 of those are locally funded, and then 431 are state funded. So that leaves 
uh, 175 positions that still have to be funded. It's really important to note this, though, that through the leadership of Governor McMaster and the General Assembly, over the past two and a half years, we've seen an increase in state-funded SROs from 171 to 431. So that represents, in two and a half years, a 152% increase in state-funded SROs in South Carolina schools. So we're very confident that with that, with that record of success and with the continued support of the governor's office and the General Assembly, we're going to see an SRO in every school. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, just a few more, few more points. Uh, this Center for School Safety, I said, is, I believe is, is unique, and it's going to be uh, most productive in the last few years, we've done a lot of things about schools. One of them, just to remind people, we've raised teacher salaries just since I've been in office by $12,500 a year for a starting teacher salary. We've expanded full day 5K to every low income four year old child in the state. And we've changed the funding formula for schools so that we know exactly how much money is going where and how it's being spent. But this step today with this Center for School Safety and Targeted Violence is, is a result of communicate, as you can see by the people here, the, you have school people, you have city, you have county people, you have state people, law enforcement, civilians. Communication, collaboration, cooperation works every single time. And one, one way that that is going to be demonstrated is what we, was mentioned a moment ago, and that's that school mapping by Ms. Weaver, uh, Superintendent Weaver. And that is something, I, I first saw it back in, I think, 2012, with the concept of having a, a dashboard, a computer, as we have in all the police vehicles, where all law, en law enforcement, when the signal goes out, 9-11 or otherwise, that there's a problem, that they can all go on to that computer and see a diagram of the school with lines showing the hallways and the, the gymnasiums and otherwise. And in, in the, the language that is used in, in that school, some call it a cafeteria. If you have a cafeteria and an auditorium, they, sometimes they call that a cafetorium. They're just they're different language and we gotta all speak the same language. But they'll be able to go on that and each communicate with the other and know exactly where the incident occurred, there'll be a blue or red dot on that diagram of that school. You'll be able to see where the doors are in and out and all of that. And they'll be able to then converge and to bring the force to help that school resource officer. And as I say, we, we're putting more money in the budget this time to bridge that gap that the director talked about to see that we have a trained, armed, certified police officer in every school in South Carolina. So that's what, uh, that's what we're doing, and that's going to cost, that's $13.4 million that we're putting for 175 new school resource officers. The, the school safety grants, we're asking for $20 million for the go to the Department of Education to award school safety grants to the school districts to do what? To upgrade the classrooms, to upgrade the internal door locks, secure the entry points, uh, maybe provide window covers, bulletproof glass where necessary, all of those uh, kinds of things we're going to provide to the schools to keep our children and the teachers and everyone in that school safe. And they not, not only have to be safe, they have to know they're safe. If they have to look over their shoulder and worry the whole time they're in school, then they're not going to be able to learn. You can't be distracted particularly by that. But one other thing we have to do I'm calling on the General Assembly again. All of these things we've mentioned so far cost money. And we're going to spend the money. Because there's nothing more important. Is that sign up there says, Four Walls with Tomorrow Inside. That's what these children are. That's a great expression. And we're going to see to it that they're educated. We've got great universities. We've got two-year, four-year colleges, best technical college system in the whole world. And we're going to see to it that our people, young people, you know, something about young people, they, they're children, they grow up to be people. And we're going to see to it that they have that chance to, to get educated. 
but we have got to keep them safe in another way as well that costs no money. All you have to do is have a majority of the House and the Senate to say yes, to say aye, and vote in favor of graduated penalties for illegal gun possession and usage. Doesn't cost a penny. It was debated last time, it's been debated before. There's no reason on earth where these career criminals that do it over and over again are not subjected to increasing penalties when they do it again and again. We must do that. The criminals these days don't break into houses to steal guns. They steal them out of people's cars. You see them walking along just pulling on the door handles. That's where they steal that gun. That's an illegal gun. If someone underage has a gun, that's an illegal gun. If the gun has a serial number filed off, that's an illegal gun. We need to be able to prosecute those people for committing those crimes, particularly with illegal guns and those penalties need to escalate. The more they do it, if they do it again, it needs to be a tougher penalty, a stronger penalty. Unless we do that, that revolving door is gonna keep spinning. So I'd ask everyone here to communicate, collaborate, cooperate, and tell the members of the General Assembly and anyone else who has a voice and wants to express it, that we need to be certain that we stop this repeat offenders with these illegal guns that are bringing them everywhere, including into this school, every, every school. This one, of course, they're not coming in here now because there's nobody here, but they're going into schools all over our state and all over, the, all over the country. So that is our number one law enforcement priority in this legislative session. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Good question. We got to continue to encourage people to get into our profession. Obviously, uh, as I, I told uh, Superintendent Weaver this morning, uh, not every uh, officer is made to go into a school environment. I mean, er officers have um, they have things that they uh, characteristics that uh, like every everybody else, and 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 so we have to. What I can tell you what has happened with pay in South Carolina because of the governor and the General Assembly over the last two years with state law enforcement, we've seen pay increase for local agencies as well. That certainly is a benefit to local agencies is, is pay. Uh, people that get in this profession do not get in it just for pay, but uh, it helps. It helps when... Uh, when they don't have to go out and get a second job to make earn a living for you know for married and, and got two children, and so we've got to continue to go out and, and actively recruit uh, young people, let them know that this is an honorable profession that we're in, and uh, and 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 like I say, that's that's a little bit difficult right now. Every agency in the country is facing recruitment and retention problems when it comes to law enforcement, and so. Uh, we have to do a better job of, of making this job something that they can be proud of. And uh, we have to have integrity and honesty in what we do and, and show young people that, that this is a job that, that again, is a very honorable job. It's a, it's a job that, that we need honest people in. And so we just have to continue to work at it. We're asking for money for 175. I, th I think they're about 131 or something like that that have not been filled. Uh, no, uh, not sure. There is money in the budget. There some has been left over from before, but this will be this will be enough in this ne next um, budget to fund the whole thing. Governor, I wanted to address the question about teachers. Um, and I think it's vitally important that both our law enforcement community and our teachers know that we have their backs. And what I hear most often in traveling the state is that teachers talk about how thankful they are for the continued focus on salary increases. And I thank the governor and the General Assembly for their leadership um, in pushing that critical piece of the puzzle forward. But just as often, I hear teachers talk about safety concerns. 
concerns, issues around um, discipline um, and student behavior. And so I think that again speaks to the need to have an all of the above strategy. It's not just the issue of teacher pay, it's about creating environments where teachers feel valued and where they feel safe. Um, and there are a lot of different ways that we have to get at that. Some of those that we've mentioned are obviously the training that's going to happen at this center here today. Um, ways to get our arms around student behavior. Again, I'd like to emphasize that we have got to talk about cell phone and social media use and the negative impact that it is having on our students. So I think that's one really concrete way um, that we get at retaining great teachers. Um, but I also think we have to take an all of the above approach in thinking about new ways into both the law enforcement or the teaching profession. So at the department, we manage um, different um, ways for alternative pathways to teacher certification um, and I think we need to continue to grow that pipeline and, and just this morning Chief Keel and I were talking about the incredible training that they're doing um, for folks who are maybe private security so that they have the same baseline of training um, that our SROs are um, expected to know when they're in that school environment so I think looking at things that maybe other states have done um, to recruit perhaps retired veterans um, to support SROs in their work um, it does necessarily have to be a sworn law enforcement officer. There has to be a high level of training, which is why a facility like this is so important. But I think we have to have an all of the above approach if we're going to meet the challenge and the need. We are. We, we just had an architectural firm come in and do an assessment. Obviously, it's an older school that's been closed for some time. We have some uh, mechanical issues, HVAC, and that type thing uh, that's going to have to be fixed. So they've come in and, and done an assessment. That was about three weeks ago. We're waiting to get their assessment back, and then we will take the uh, appropriated funds that were for capital investment, uh, and we'll prioritize those those needs to, to get our facility get the facility up and, and ready to go And so, you know again, we, we will have some construction some painting some uh, Work on the HVAC systems uh, to make it uh, make it run But I would say probably within the next six months. Uh, we we should be up and running as a facility, but uh, There's nothing to say that we won't be doing uh, training here prior to that. Um, well, it goes back to um, our unit uh, had found this building through our school safety officers, Chris Ellisor, who's, who's here, again, been very supportive of what we do in, as far as training. And uh, this facility was vacant, and there was conversations had about the possibility of using this vacant facility. And, um, and like I say, uh, Lexington won whether the board knew what all we were doing or not, but uh, they opened the doors. They opened the doors for us, and uh, and so we started training here about 2017. And uh, and uh, again, the school had everything that we needed to to the type facility we needed, and it was more and more difficult to find uh, schools. Um, you know, we were doing a lot of training in the summertime when school was out. But then we started running into issues with, uh, you had schools that were doing renovations during the summertime, you had summer school. It got more and more difficult to find that location to, to do it in a real school environment. And so, um, so we've been, been here for a while and that's the way it came about. And that grew into, again, the partnership that we have today with Lexington School District 1 and, and every, everyone here was on board in, in allowing us to do this. And without them, uh, we wouldn't be having this press conference today. Yes, it's our understanding and talking to several different vendors that offer this type of service that the initial $5 million investment would cover all schools in South Carolina and there may be some ongoing cost associated with the maintenance and updating of that system, but really the upfront investment is the big, is the big chunk of change. So what now about Well, 
I, I can only tell you that, so I have met with superintendents over the course of the last four or five years. And uh, from my perspective and from what I've heard, I've heard no, um, very little support for arming teachers in classrooms. And when I've had the opportunity to talk to teachers as well, that's the same thing I've heard from them. So I, I don't hear that support for arming teachers and administrators uh, from the school personnel and, and administrators that I've talked to. Absolutely. So this facility will be made available to every law enforcement agency in the state to come in, do training. It will all be at no cost. Again, we will also bring in our other partners, our, our uh, certainly in the school environment, administrators, principals, teachers. Um, we'll, we'll bring in our fire and EMS folks, our other first responders that will do rescue force training uh, with our folks. And so it will be a facility that will be open and, and uh, we hope to be offering training here five days a week. And, and again, it will be at no cost to, to anyone. Uh, we will provide that training. What, what we will do is uh, any time that we have any training that may be, uh, have somewhat uh, noise to it, we will uh, let them know ahead of time. Again, as we said, we've been training here since 2017 already, and we've been communicating with our neighbors. And, and as I said earlier, we want to be a good neighbor, and we're going to be a good neighbor, and we're going to be a good partner with the community here in Gilbert. No, absolutely not. And, and, and we want to offer opportunities. We, we want, we're going to have the opportunity to offer training to uh, residents here in this community as well. And we want to be able to do that uh, for this community for accepting us and allowing us to be here and do what we're going to do. Okay. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming. We'll sign it in a, in a minute. This is a ceremonial because it was, was actually signed in, uh, back in June. But I want to thank everybody for working so hard. To, to make this uh, make this happen, make this a reality, and this this is what progress looks like in South Carolina.